Well, I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's uh, hearing of August 14th, 2023. Um, today we have uh, Grace Cottage and Northwestern in the morning. And then this afternoon we will have uh, Rutland. Um, and so uh, I think uh, Matt Sutter will be doing the Grace Cottage and Northwestern walkthrough. And then Director Sarah Lindbergh will be doing Rutland this afternoon. So I'll turn it over to Russ McCracken to swear in the witnesses, and then Mr. Sutter can take it over from there. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Foster. Uh, for the Grace Cottage team, who um, will be presenting and answering questions today? Doug's on mute, so I'll speak for him. Doug DeVillo, CEO, and myself, Stephen Brown, CFO. Great, if you could both Raise your right hand, so I'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth? So help you God. I do. All right. Thanks very much. Uh, and I believe the floor is yours. Great. Well, good morning, and thank you for for uh, having us today. Um, we um, were very. Um, uh, pleased to be able to meet with you to present our budget and answer uh, questions about it. Um, we put a lot of work into um, uh, refining our uh, our budget for 2024. Although I I will say you know we do continuous uh, you know, budget development all year long at Grace Cottage. Uh, we review the budget every month and make adjustments as we go in terms of our operating strategies and our our fiscal um, determination. So, you know, doing the budget every year is a pretty simple process for us because uh, the 2024 budget is really just a continuation of our 2023 uh, activity and performance, uh, which we think has been uh, quite exemplary, given the, given the the challenges and the struggles, and uh, you know, the 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 difficulties in um, in running healthcare organizations uh, these days. So. Um, Hopefully, uh, we'll be able to answer your questions and, and make it very clear what we want to uh, do in 2024 as far as our financial uh, strategies are concerned. For those who don't know Grace Cottage uh, uh, all that well, there may be a couple of you, two or three of you. Uh, I just want to say a couple things about the organization. You know, we're an independent, uh, not-for-profit healthcare facility. We're located in rural southeastern Vermont, about uh, 19 miles north of Brattleboro. Um, our multi-facility uh, uh, campus uh, of about 10 and a half acres uh, includes a 19-bed critical access hospital where we provide skilled rehabilitation, we provide acute care, we provide palliative care, and of course, 24-7 emergency care. Uh, in fact, we just recently completed a renovation of our ED to add an additional 17 by 42 foot um, uh, extension to better serve our community and to better um, uh, increase our um, productivity and uh, our accessibility to patients. And uh, we're very proud of that, uh, that renovation. Um, we also have a, a full service laboratory here in the hospital. We have a diagnostic imaging suite, which includes a uh, recently updated uh, CT scanner. Um, one of the things we're really proud of uh, here at Grace Cottage is our rural health clinic. It's kind of the crown jewel of our organization, um, where 13 healthcare facility, healthcare, healthcare providers provide over 31,000 patient uh, visits, both primary and mental health visits uh, every year uh, within the clinic. Um, so it's quite a, a large um, operating unit for Grace Cottage. Uh, we also have a, a very rapidly growing outpatient rehabilitation department where we provide physical and occupational therapy. Uh, we have a full service uh, pharmacy, uh, low retail pharmacy located across the street from the hospital at Messenger Valley Pharmacy. And uh, we also have a, a community wellness center uh, where we all offer wellness programs for uh, the local and surrounding communities. Um, as I said, we're dedicated to providing primary care. We don't do anything uh, in the way of uh, invasive procedures here. We don't have an operating room. Um, we uh, we really focus on emergency medicine, 
uh, cute uh, uh, and uh, uh, skilled uh, and uh, uh, rehabilitation services within our facility, and obviously our large uh, uh, rural health clinic where we provide tens of thousands of visits to patients, where we focus on wellness and keeping people out of the hospital and keeping uh, people on track to taking care of themselves. And that's really what we're known for and what we're, what we're quite proud of. And as you'll see yeah. in the budget, when you review the numbers, you'll see that we've had a, a pretty substantial uh, uh, growth in our volumes uh, year over year. And uh, that's really helped us to um, uh, to weather uh, some of the challenges uh, that a lot of hospitals are facing uh, on the tail end of uh, this terrible pandemic we've had to deal with. So um, with those opening comments, I'll ask Stephen if he wants to add anything to um, any of the things that I've had to say. And uh, if not, we'll answer questions. This is great. Well, I think yeah. you gave a good quick overview and happy to try and answer any questions you might have about what we submitted that we haven't already responded to. Okay. See ya. Thank you very much for lunch. Someone's unmuted. Um, I'm getting a little feedback there. I believe I muted that. Um, are you thank able you. to hear me? Sorry. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> no worries. All right. So uh, in our efforts at continuous improvement, uh, we just wanted to make sure before we dive in that we uh, that we Sorry, I don't know why. Okay, am I not the one presenting? Okay, I'll try and share another way, sorry, but we wanted to um, just make sure that our conversation today is focused. So you can see that uh, the topics in the Grace Cottage budget that we wanted to make sure to hit uh, were just making sure we understood some of the variation in the cost inflation assumptions, um, understanding the amount of the charge increase likely to or expected to be realized from commercial insurers, making sure we're all clear on that. Uh, just uh, covering a question that was already asked about uh, the Medicaid price increases um, and covering some ACO participation, uh, some of the referral and follow up responses, as well as the um, lag and visit information. So. With that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Matt Butter to go over the budget. So I will be driving for him. Go ahead, Matt. Thanks, Sarah. Can you all hear me? All right. Great. Yes. Okay, so looking at the overview, um, if we just restrict this to critical access hospitals, you can kind of get a better feel for Grace Cottage's position here. Um, consider NPR growth was just over 16%, so above the benchmark, but below the growth in operating expenses of about 14%. Um, notably, however, if you see those, their charge master and commercial price increases, they're at four and 2% respectively. Um, so growing more for utilization, it suggests. Um, if we go to the FY24 tab, thanks, <laughs> it's a little small. Sorry. So going down the list, as we just mentioned, um, NPR and operating expenses exceeded the benchmark. Uh, the NPR exceeded the benchmark. We didn't have a uh, explicit benchmark for operating expenses, so, but um, for labor, it's grown within the benchmark. Um, and if we switch real quick to the labor tab, I think we can see that it's grown. Um, and then, yeah, thank you. Um, you can see kind of it's cut more, it's kind of kept in line with the ECI benchmark starting by 17. Um, and then, going, sorry, going back to the FY24 budget. Um, I was. I wanted to pause real quick and make sure. I didn't think we had any questions about their labor estimates or utilization on the staff level, but I wanted to pause um, real quick, make sure there's no 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 questions from the board. Matt, I had one on commercial price. Oh, I'll wait if that's a different. Okay. Yeah. I think. 
Um, just on the overview, it said 2%, and here it's 9.3. Is that just because the time period is different here than in the overview page? That's correct. Yeah. So this is for 24 over 23 is 9.3, but then on the overview, it's 22 actual to 24 budget. Oh, no, this is 23. Yeah, and I'd, I'd say that um, I don't want to speak uh, for Mr. Brown, but uh, I'd say that that exhibit was a real bear, especially for some of the smaller hospitals. So um, this 9.3 uh, might be not the most uh, relevant indicator uh, for how the, uh, is it also including volume increase in that period, not just that we increased? I think the 2% is we got an additional 2% reimbursement on anything that we build to commercial versus the total commercial that we got went up by 9.3 based on the fact that the volumes are up. Yeah, this was designed sense? to try to, yeah, it was designed to try to just get the effective price uh, over the yeah. two years in that exhibit 10 and it's it's not a trivial thing to pull out price and utilization and often no uh yeah yeah uh, i can assure you our commercial okay. increases have not gone up any part of 9.3 percent what would you say it has gone up from 22 well, to you 24? know it varies certainly by payer but the ma majority of our commercial payments are based on fee schedules um everything in the rural health clinic is based on fee schedules defined by the commercial insurers. And, you know, at best, they go up a minimal inflation factor each year. They set those. We don't have any control over those. It's not really relevant even what we bill the commercial insurers um, for anything that's paid on a fee schedule. So for anything in the rural health clinic, the majority of our, excuse me, our outpatient work for commercial is also paid on fee schedule. For instance, everything Blue Cross pays us as one of our biggest payers for both diagnostic imaging and lab is all a fee schedule that they determine. Again, it's increased annually based on a very minimal inflation factor. So I think the 2% is probably an average overall of what we got additionally for any particular item that we build one year over the next. Thank you very much. I do have a question about utilization if we're ready okay. for it. Sure. Um, so I noted I did notice in your submission that uh, and as you just spoke to your utilization is based on current levels of volume for the first seven months of fiscal year 23. Could you give us a little bit of color commentary on what areas that utilization seems to be most prominent? Is it across the board, mostly in the rural health clinic? Um, the biggest area is in the emergency department. I mean, mind you, our average number of encounters in the emergency department is gen was generally in the single digit, so we're not talking huge volume. But thus far this year, the emergency department has been up like 40 plus percent over budgeted number of encounters, um, which you know only gets you from say eight to 12 a day. Um, but the outpatient rehab is physical therapy and occupational therapy is way over budget and continues to be. We she's got a stack of referrals for outpatient work people are pre-booking for post-surgery you know through like visits in december and it's just i don't know if it's people are finally getting work done that they put off throughout the pandemic or more and more people are just needing to get work done probably based on the health of the general population that's part of it um but they've been extremely busy just you know people walking in the door. So the, the rural health clinic has been a little busier. The providers are seeing a few more patients, um, but it's mostly those two areas. And then of course, as the emergency department's busier, um, 
some of the diagnostic imaging, particularly CT, is also over budget on the outpatient side, mostly related to emergency department visits as well as some lab. Thank we you. haven't changed any service lines. It's just more people coming in to use those. Thank you. Uh, just a quick follow up question about um, I'm wondering if with, with the increases in volume and ED uh, visits, how many beds are you currently staffing? I know you have a 19 bed critical access hospital, but we have, a, we have 19 staffing? beds um, set up or licensed for and set up or available. We generally have a staffing level for an average daily census of 12 to 13, and that's pretty much where we've been running most times. Um, I think our current average for the year is um, for total acute and swing is like 10.8 or something like that. But, you know, that's usually fluctuating between an average or a daily census of 12 to 13 down to eight or nine, you know, going up and down depending on when the admissions come and go. But it's, on average, there's around 10 to 11 people in the building at any one time. Great. Thank you. If there are no other questions about utilization, I think we can move to uh, pharmaceutical costs and cost inflation. Um, okay. Uh, I was just wondering, so your your pharmaceutical expenses um, increased about in line with our with what we've seen across other uh, hospitals, and the cost inflation also met the benchmark. I was just wondering if you could maybe speak, provide more detail um, for context for what you guys are seeing for cost inflation across um, different services or different um, supplies, pharmaceuticals, just kind of speak to what you guys are seeing um, this year. You know, our inflation. pharmaceutical cost, as you'll see, <clears throat> excuse me, compared with other facilities is a relatively small number, um, you know, in great part because we do not do any surgeries or, and or um, cancer type drug treatments. So the majority of what we have from a pharmaceutical standpoint are in general relatively lower cost items and not huge volumes. It's, you know, mostly small amounts for outpatient ER visits and whatever our inpatients, which are primarily swing beds. So, you you know, by the time they get to our facility, they're not usually on, you know, some of the ne drugs necessarily that an acute, high level acute patient would be getting. Um, and it stays pretty consistent, but as with anything else, some drugs go up a lot some go up a little bit. Um, it's really hard predicting inflation. You know, I mean, looking at the numbers that we quoted in our narrative overall for various areas, you know, those are best guess as trying to base it on what it has been over the past year, what you think it might be, so, a few of the things, you know, you might have predicted growths coming from our group purchasing thing saying we might see this going up. But sometimes, you know, I'm sitting here, I'll sit here and look at accounts payable bills and see that, you know, a food item went up 10% from one week to the next. It's just still so fluctuates so much on things that you have no control over. So, were there any other staff questions on the uh, cost inflation? I think I'm good. Laura, anything from you? No, thank were, you. Are, were there any board questions on uh, pharmaceutical expenses or cost inflation? Any questions from the healthcare advocate on any of the topics we've covered so far? Forgive me, I completely forgot to ask that. That's okay. No, good morning. This is Sam from the Healthcare Advocate. Nothing from us on this. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, 
Matt, would you like to walk through this or would you prefer I do it? I, I think you can probably, I can do it, but it will be a little, it'll probably waste a little bit of people's no time. <laughs> so, thank you. <laughs> um, so we know cost reports are uh, in, you know, measuring one thing. Uh, and what stands out to me is even among critical access hospitals, Grace Cottage is extremely small. So right at that uh, bottom end uh, of the distribution here. So as a reminder, uh, this mark in the middle would be the median. So half of the values are below it and half of the values are above it uh, down to the 25th percentile. So and up to the 75th percentile. So we have our middle 50% of the data and then we have one and a half times the distance uh, in that box right. plot. And we see that uh, Grace Cottage is very, very tiny. <laughs> Um, and you know, I don't have to interrupt you, Sarah, but just, you know, comparing us with the other seven critical access hospitals, you know, as is, as you well know, is the best comparison you, you can have. But in reality, we don't even compare with them because we do not do two things that make up the majority of the business in both, which is operating room, surgical suites and delivering babies, which are both, you know, high volume and cost services that we don't have so that's what really what makes us stand out so much from everybody else right yeah totally and and you see that in the you know re very relatively low acuity so just over one yep. um and then we see uh oh so this is kind of the inverse of that small uh, issue where the ratio of uh admin to clinical is uh quite high and i believe that would be due to uh, relative to these other ones uh, at 36 percent right. we certainly see those numbers uh, for some other hospitals for different reasons so um, i'm assuming this has to do with some uh, fixed costs but i'm uh, curious how you interpret that exactly i mean you know we're spreading say uh human resources director over a smaller number of employees you know you everybody has one human resources director when you're dividing it by 19 the employees for a 19 bed hospital versus the employees for a 25 bed hospital and pretty much that applies to a lot of positions throughout the facility a lot of fixed costs in it, particularly a small facility like this yeah and i was just curious you know uh, back of the envelope of your you know operating expenses um how many of those uh are related to the fixed costs associated with Labor. I mean, and again, it's also hard, you know, when you look at a lot of those kind of positions where they're, you know, they fall under, say, administrative costs, but they're a lot of what they do on a day to day basis is job responsibilities that might otherwise be, be on somebody else's budget be not showing up in administrative costs because you've got a whole separate position doing that and it's classified as something different. So that also makes a huge difference here. Certainly not that we're paying yeah. all those people far more than they're all getting at any of the other eight facilities or seven facilities. Right, right. Um, and then uh, I'm just, uh, I don't even think you're, yeah. So uh, cash available to operations, obviously not surprising to see that on the smaller side as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and then for EBITAR, uh, I'm sorry, EBITAR uh, per adjusted discharge, we see, um, I think that you were just here near the, there we are. I have to keep working on that. So a uh, little bit profitable, certainly still uh, 22 is nowhere near where anyone expected to be. Um, and as far as the cost per adjusted discharge, we've got, uh, I think you're right in this clump at uh, 14,000. So again, uh, and, and thanks to those who have given this um, some diligence more accurately saying that this is the average cost per Medicare discharge, which is adjusted for that acuity. So uh, we see kind of, uh, see kind most, of, of our, most of our. See some bunching there bunching for there the for Vermont, Vermont hospitals. Vermont. So any uh, board or HCA questions related to the cost report results here? Nothing from us, Sarah. We wanted to ask about the admin and general salary ratio, but you asked that, so thank you. Sure thing.
Hey, Sarah, um, real, real quick on the oh, ad, on the admin. What are which hospitals in of these others do you think are most comparable to Grace Cottage in size? And where are they on admin? So the, the closest Mo one for size would be Mona Scutney. I, I'm sorry, I won't steal your thunder. <laughs> no, I was just they um, I think from from an actual bed size, we are the only one we are 19. Everybody else is 25, correct? I'm pretty sure. Um, but again, everybody else, when you're taking that as a percentage of, say, total operating expenses, we don't have the operating expenses such as running surgical suites and things that are a huge, huge additional amount. The next, what's the next closest expense overall expense level compared to us is probably significantly higher. Yeah, and I think the other thing we I always think about with any percentage is um, low numbers, low denominators just add a lot of volatility to this. So, um, yeah, so I think that's another important point. Um, um, and then for <clears throat> cost coverage, so again, this is uh, repricing uh, claims uh, based on the uh, Medicare allowable cost. Um, and uh, looking at how that cost coverage is uh, over time. So we see some, you know, relative improvements in the commercial cost coverage for outpatient. Um, and it looks like a bump up in inpatient after uh, quite a bit of uh, stagnation, but still not up to 100% uh, Medicare, you know, fixed at that kind of uh, cost-based reimbursement. Right. And uh, see quite low uh, relative cost coverage for uh, Medicaid outpatient, uh, a little relative improvement that seems to have been lost over time for Medicaid. Um, and we see <clears throat> um, that actually a relatively lower cost overall uh, in delivering those services for commercial uh, residents or I'm sorry, uh, recipients of care uh, with cost coverage, uh, about 148% of that Medicare allowable cost, um, but seeing again, only half of the cost coverage for Medicaid. So um, almost kind of a push, I'd say, between those two bu buckets. And any questions on uh, this set of data before we... Okay. Um, and so this one, um, remember, we've uh, lumped things together for uh, several years here. Oops. And it can be difficult to actually see these guys pop. So apologies as I hunt around a little bit, but I think that might be. Hmm. Oh, you're too small to be in this data set. Of course, that's why <laughs> there's no grace to highlight. So, uh, it, and so there's a need to be a certain number of discharges to be included in the RAM study. And even if you lump uh, three years together, uh, they don't qualify for uh, a public data file. So just always helpful to remind ourselves um, how relatively small uh, Grace Cottage is compared to other hospitals. Um, so I think that. That is the data portion. So uh, I'll turn it back over to Matt to kind of help uh, facilitate any other discussion. Great, thanks, Al. Um, we had a question about um, ACL participation. I was wondering if you could speak to that. Um, any plans for the, the coming year? Uh, we don't have any uh, specific plans for the coming year. We've had discussions with uh, the ACO over the last couple of years, and you know the, the the biggest problem for Grace Cottage is number one, we have such a, uh, a we we really don't have a, a significant uh, uh, opportunity to really impact uh, overall cost of care across the entire state of Vermont. Um, and when you look at the the cost of participation in terms of the dues that we would have to pay, uh, as well as the, uh, the potential risk uh, that would uh, 
that would be we'd be exposed to uh, if in fact prices were to, were to, to go up uh, across the the ACO and we would have to you know we'd have to we we would be um, uh, really in a in a position where we wouldn't be able to afford to to handle any type of uh, a risk on that side so we've had discussions with them about uh, ways that we can participate you know without being treated like a full service PBS hospital, but you know those discussions really haven't uh, come to fruition, uh, and uh, you know so so really from the standpoint of cost and the standpoint of risk, um, given the our size and given you know how little uh, uh, you know cash we have at any given time, we we just we just can't justify uh, you know putting our organization at that level of risk. Uh, you know, nor nor do we see any real significant benefit that the ACO could could provide to Grace Cottage to offset those those risks. So uh, that's kind of what our where our discussions have been, uh, and uh, you know, we're we're certainly um, you know open to to further conversations with the ACO, but we really haven't uh, you know been successful in coming up with a model that would uh, uh, make it. Um, you know, makes sense for us from from the standpoint of um, our responsibility for uh, you know, keeping our, our organization uh, out of a risky you know endeavor. Uh, so that's really kind of where we're at with that. Thank you. I think that's what I had for staff questions. So um, looking to the board for any additional questions. I'm wondering if um, you could speak a little bit to the Medicaid redetermination effort and how that might or might not be factored into your budget. Um, we did not factor anything specific in, truthfully having zero idea how much it might affect depending on how many people either lost their coverage or additional people got it. But we have been working very proactive. We have a very top-notch resource advocate in this facility that works closely with all of our patients, um, particularly with Medicaid patients, and will do anything she possibly can to get help them fill all of their paperwork out. And, you know, are very hopeful that anybody that simply isn't getting their Medicaid because of not completing the paperwork, that shouldn't be an issue. Now, granted, there will certainly be some people that may lose it once they submit it, because they're no longer eligible, but um, we did not factor any specific amount in for that, no. Thanks, and if I'm remembering correctly, she helps folks uh, sign up for the exchange plans, insurance yes, plans Yes, she will help well. them yeah. for anything exchange. She goes beyond, above and beyond, helps them sign up for fuel assistance, anything, any types of resources, but her primary job function is, yes, signing up for either the exchange or doing Medicaid paperwork. And truthfully, as Sarah just pointed out, um, if somebody loses their Medicaid, chances are they're probably going to be eligible for 100% reduced fee still anyway, or close. So as she pointed out, we our reimbursement on Medicaid patients is so low, what we're really going to do is it won't have a huge impact on the bottom line. It'll just transfer it from a Medicaid contractual allowance. I mean, a Medicaid contractual allowance to a free care line. So just a different kind of deduction. Um, I had one question and I'm not intimately familiar with the program, but have you considered the rural emergency hospital designation? And I was curious if there's any opportunity there, if that's something that would ever be pursued in the future? I mean, we looked at it briefly when it came out. I mean, it certainly could maybe be a possibility for this facility um, at some point down the road, although I don't, you know, it would mean us getting rid of our inpatient beds altogether. And at this point, you know, there's a shortage of skilled nursing beds in the facility, which the majority of our inpatient, as you can tell, looking at any statistics if we submit them, um, which we don't do that kind of level of detail in the last couple of years, but the majority of our inpatient business is swing bed. Um, so, you know, the one average of one, say, a acute patient we have a year could certainly maybe be taken care of somewhere else, but I'm not sure where those 
other 10 or 11 patients every day for skilled nursing would go. Um, but it would also make a whole lot of other changes to the facility in that, you know, part of what, for instance, pays for all of our diagnostic imaging equipment is the fact and lab equipment is the fact that you need that for the inpatient services as well. So they're helping spread that cost out over those things. Whereas if you no longer had the inpatient business, you'd be trying to have all of those services available with only your primarily emergency department revenue and whatever the primary care patients needed. So it's a lot of factors that you know, it's not just the inpatient beds you're talking about. It's how that volume of business affects your overall organization. And then you'd, you know, you'd still need a CEO. You'd still need a CFO. And now you're dividing that over an even smaller number of service lines and or total business. Increasing that administrative expenses expense. May I ask that a quick follow up question okay. to that actually? Sure. Chair Foster? Please, yeah. Um, I mean, we, we have been hearing from other hospitals about the, the difficulty in placement of their acute, you know, their subacute patients to skilled nursing facilities in the state. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just wondering, given that you have, you know, um, 19 bed capacity, um, but you're averaging 10 beds on average mm -hmm. a day, I mean, has there been thought to increasing scale and so that you could spread some of those fixed costs and provide more skilled SNF, you know, skilled nurse, nursing facility beds for the state? We would actually be more than happy to take additional and keep our average daily census at 1617. I'll be completely honest with you. And as many of your, as some of your questions certainly um, allude, uh, know about base that you asked on all hospitals is skilled patients and the re one of the reasons they're getting hard to replace no matter where they're going is um that skilled patients are getting increasingly more complex they all have comorbidities Back at long gone are the days where the majority of our swing bed patients, I mean, I can remember <clears throat> not that many years ago where almost every swing bed patient we had was probably somebody who had a hip or a knee replacement. They were just here getting PT or OT for a couple of weeks and they went home. Relatively simple to take care of. Now, the majority or of our inpatient swing beds patients Although they may still be getting PT and OT, a lot of them are here for um, IV treatments or all kinds of other things. They're just here because they are sick in so many ways. But that that we have to be careful to make sure they're people that we can take care of. But what's become more of an issue is not wanting to get stuck with those patients once they're done being a skilled patient and they need to go to a long-term care facility. And there are not enough long term care facilities, meaning that patient is not going to end up going back home. They have to go to a nursing home. And then we end up with a bunch of, you know, long term care patients waiting to go to a nursing home where we're either not getting paid really anything for them to be here, like a hundred or two hundred dollars a day, um, or as we actually quoted in our narrative response. We've had a couple of different ones over the last year where we've had a patient, one of those patients here for three months, where we were taking care of that patient for three months, waiting for Medicaid to process the patient's paperwork so that they would be able to be transferred to a long-term care facility. We had the beds available, but the long-term care facilities won't take them without their paperwork done. So, you know, that's not anything we can change. Um, but we have that's part of, you know, there's a lot of patients that we don't take for that very reason, because we know that after the end of a week or two weeks of being a skilled patient, they're just going to be occupying one of our beds and you get two or three of them here. And then you're no longer able to take the ones that the acute facilities are trying to get rid of for us to take care of that we should be taking care of. So it's another drawback of. Both a shortage of long term care beds 
in this area particularly, as well as most of the people in this area are relying on Medicaid. So what percentage of patients do you turn away because you know that there will not be a eventual um, long-term care placement? I don't know. I have an exact number. I mean, it could be, and it's also hard to tell because we don't always know. For instance, when Dartmouth wants to send a patient to a skilled facility, they send a mass thing out to all the skilled facilities that could take that patient, everybody around them versus, and even down to here, if it's somebody who's from this area and they might get acceptance for that patient to go somewhere else before we have a chance to get back to them. The process of us accepting a patient when that happens is we get a referral from Dartmouth saying, we have a patient that's gonna be ready for skilled bed tomorrow, say. It gets reviewed, that medical documentation gets reviewed by our hospitalists, by our pharmacy department to make sure we've got the whatever is available for them, by our rehab department to make sure. So all three of those departments have to make sure that they can take care of that patient before we accept them. The other thing that's becoming a huge problem is with so many Medicare patients switching to Medicare Advantage plans and getting authorization for skilled stays from those. It sometimes takes two, three days or up to a week to get a authorization. And they will sometimes, we've run into a lot lately where we just had one a couple of weeks ago where the person literally lives three doors down from my office here in town, wanted to come from Dartmouth. The insurance company was insisting that they go to a facility nearby Dartmouth. They wanted to get six denials from facilities within a 30 mile radius of Dartmouth first before they would consider authorizing them to come here. I, I mean, why? I don't know. My presumption is they didn't want to pay the ambulance ride any further than 30 miles. I don't know. But, you know, there's just so much of that happening lately that it's, and that's partly why they get stuck in places like Dartmouth. It's it's waiting for us, even if we're going to take that patient, to get that prior authorization from the commercial insurance companies. Thank you very much. Are there any other board questions? Seeing none, I'll ask the healthcare advocate if they have any additional questions. Nothing up from us. Thank you. Seeing none, I believe we'll do we do. I'm sorry, public questions. Um, I think is the next. And Chair Foster, I don't know that I can see if there's any questions so oh um i don't see any at this time could i just ask a quick question which is out of a total revenue um standpoint dave merman sorry i don't think we've we've met before new, new uh, to the we have not. nice to meet you both but <laughs> out of a total revenue standpoint um what's the breakdown of inpatient to outpatient for your organization it, 20 2080 or Ah, um, I can. The, sure I... Um, out of the so our gross patient revenue that we submitted in the budget is forty four million dollars. Strictly outpatient of that is about twenty seven million. So our outpatient business is a little over half of the total revenue submitted. Inpatient, if you combine inpatient and swings together is about eleven million. So about twenty five percent of our total um revenue and then the remainder is the primary care practice which is just under eight million of that 44 million i'm sorry so is inpatient the 11 11 million or the 27 million 11. okay oh that's in gross in gross yes So roughly a quarter quarter inpatient to seventy five percent outpatient is where the breakdown is. Just 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 more curiosity Correct. than anything. Yep. Yes. Great. Thank you.
seeing no public comment or questions, I will turn it back to Chair Foster. Or I think that's correct. Or Susan, I don't know. I'll, please correct me if that's incorrect. <laughs> so getting used to it for new process. Yeah, no worries. Um, so uh, seeing no comments from the public, we'd like to have the hospital um, get one more chance to kind of leave us with your parting thoughts. And uh, so we'd welcome to hear anything you want to leave us with today. No, I would just say, you know, we, we appreciate the opportunity to participate in this process. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we're really proud of, the, of, of our performance year over year as well as the budget we submitted for your consideration. Uh, we really believe that it accurately reflects, you know, what we need to continue to carry out our mission of taking care of our communities and our and our patients. And we believe that uh, it, it's, uh, it's prudent, it's, um, uh, it's efficient, and um, I think it really reflects the, the, the local needs of, of the healthcare of this region. And, uh, you know, we, we uh, are, Happy to answer any any questions that come up after this morning, and hopefully you'll give our, our budget uh, your fair and uh, considerate review. Thank you very much. And I think I might add, not that it necessarily is specific to this budget, but in Doug's initial comments, for those of you that aren't really familiar with where Grace Cottage is or how we're located in comparison with other hospitals, um, it is true that we're 19 miles north of Brattleboro and a little over that southwest of Springfield. But if you ever looked at a map of southeastern Vermont and where we sit on that map compared to the next closest hospitals in the north of us, we're about an hour south of Rutland and it's an hour the other direction. So it's it's the people that live in our the north service area in the north and west of us that because the question has come up many times over the years, well, what do we need Grace Cottage for? You're only 19 miles from BMH. Well, a lot of the patients have already traveled a 45 minutes or more or an hour over back mountainous roads to get here. And if we weren't here, they got to drive the other half hour to get to Brattleboro. So, you know, it's a, it's a crucial spot in this service area to have this hospital centrally located the way it is and with the rest of them so far away from a lot of those people. I drove an ambulance for when we owned one years ago for six years. And let me tell you, it's a long trip to get here from some of those locations, especially in bad weather. And when you're taking a patient from here to Brattleboro in bad weather at 2 a.m. All right, well, thank you. Um, I think at this point uh, we can adjourn until our next date, uh, which will start promptly at 10. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we need to formally adjourn chair or how that part works. Um, yeah, we can, I'll, I'll adjourn the meeting until 10 a.m. and it'll be with uh, Northwestern at 10. 10. <laughs>